Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. A very welcome, my friends, and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. Are you feeling charitable? Then smash the subscribe button and the like button. And please do follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. Well, 60 Minutes have done a very, very special article on Christopher Reeve as Superman, basically talking about Superman the movie. I want us to close our eyes. Let's close our eyes and think about the first movie you remember that made an impression on you and smile. It's great, isn't it? It's amazing. And the first movie that ever made an impression on me was Superman the movie. In fact, it made me a Superman, you know, fan. It's the first character I ever looked up to. It was an amazing film. It is an amazing film. So let's read this. 60 Minutes on Christopher Reeve as Superman. Modern superhero cinema begins with Superman, so it's only fitting that it would kick off with its own version of the Big Bang. It has a momentous quality that somehow never came across as heavy or self-involved. Like Superman himself, it's denser and more powerful than any superhero film that had been made up until then. Yet, it still takes off like a bird, like a plane. It delays its full flight for quite a long time, but when it soars, it never stops. This was an immense production, supposedly the most expensive American film up until that point, with a lot of creative minds overlapping and reworking one another. Mario Puzo's 500-page first draft was rewritten by Robert Benton and David Newman, who were rewritten who were rewritten by Newman and his wife, Leslie Newman, who were rewritten by Tom Mankiewicz, credited on the finished product, as well as on Superman 2, as creative consultant that the results feels as unified as it does is a small miracle attri att attributable to the steady hand of director Richard Donner and his cast. Right, let's be clear here. Tom Mankiewicz rewrote that whole movie. Basically, it should have just been, you know, story and written by um, Tom Mankiewicz. Now, he did adapt what they originally did, but the Kryptonian speaking that stilted English, that was all him. Uh, Krypton being this crystallized planet was all him. Um, just just amazing. All, 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 all the, although, was it John Barry, the, um, the designer who came up with the crystallized version of Krypton? I must give him credit. Margot Kidder's Lois Lane is a screwball comedy dame who smokes cigarettes and isn't shy about asking Superman if his bodily functions are normal. A prize-winning reporter and a hard-headed career woman whose first line is, how many peas in rapist? And frankly admits that she never wanted anything like the life of her sister, a suburban homemaker with children. Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor proclaims himself the greatest criminal mind of our time, then nearly proves it, and you believe that he's really that diabolically brilliant, but also an insecure person who knowingly keeps company with the, dumb, the dumbest henchman on earth, and a girlfriend who tells him every day that she only loves him for his money. D let me just go back to Lois Lane, actually, and just talk about Margot's portrayal as Lois Lane. Um, I like the line about she would never want to be like her sister. Two cats and a mortgage. Ugh, I got bananas in a week. That is proof that this is an independent, ambitious career woman. In 1978, by the way. So all these writers and actresses who reckon they're so, you know, they're so um, feminist, right? And we have the original feminist here, Lois Lane who doesn't spend the film hating on men. Wow! Imagine that, people. A better time, wasn't it? A much better time. Ned Beatty's right-hand man, Otis, is a lumbering oaf whose gait earns that tubber melody that composer John Williams saddles him with. He's like one of those dim-witted cartoon dogs who gets an idea and the fault balloon over his head contains a birthday candle instead of a light bulb. Valerie Perrine's wise-cracking um, Mole, Miss Tessmarker, landed one of the evilest, wealthiest men in the world, but seems disappointed at how easy it was, and makes wisecracks about how Lex wooed her with promises of a Park Avenue address, but gave her one 500 feet below Park Avenue. 
Former child star Jackie Cooper's Daily Planet editor, Perry White, gets high on beating the competition. He's a joyous doodle of journalists who gives, give themselves ulcers trying to live up to a stereotype of the job. And by the way, Jackie Cooper wasn't actually going to get the role. It was it was basically Dick just phoned him up because the I forgot the actor's um, name, but the original guy who was going to play him had a heart attack. So he couldn't come to London to do it. And so Dick rings him up and says, look, Aces, I need you to come over now. And, you know, Jackie was so complimentary of Dick and Christopher Reeve, you know, a really brilliant actor. Glenn Ford and Phyllis Faxter as Clark's adoptive parents, Jonathan and Martha Kent, are Norman Rockwell characters living in Andrew Weave's Waves of Grain. But you believe them as people because you want the world to be filled with people too good to be true. That's right. I'm going to cry in a minute. And these two race Superman. Therefore, they fit the description. Jeff East deserves a, a, a parenthetical shout out as well. He might have nailed Reeves' unaffected earnest earnestness anyway but Reeves dubbed voice and a bit of a prosthetic makeup good enough that in over 40 years it never occurred to me that it was makeup puts the gambit over the top yeah I must say Jeff was absolutely fantastic and I know that Jeff was very disappointed that Chris's voice was dubbed over him even though I love what Jeff did I like what they did on Man of Steel where they kind of had Henry play a younger clock and I think it works and I think Chris should have just done the performance you know, physically and in, in audio as well, because ultimately he was young enough to look like a young Clark Kent. And if you're going to dub the guy's voice over an actor's voice, it's it's not a cool thing to do. But although I like it and I think it works, I think it wasn't fair on Jeff. And I thought Jeff was brilliant, but I think Chris should have just played all the roles of Clark Kent. It would have worked out better. But still, Jeff East was awesome. First among equals is Christopher Reeve as Superman Clark Kent. Mainly a stage and TV actor when he was originally cast, he beat out countless established stars and delivered the most iconic debut male lead performance since Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia agreed. As Clark Kent and Superman respectively, a square and a super square, he held his own with actors who were known, often beloved, quantities. A, fr a, a through line of unaffected goodness connects Superman's biological parents, Superman's adoptive parents, and Superman himself. Reeve understood that Superman wasn't just a character or corporate property, he was an idea. And he played the idea in every scene, I'm getting emotional now, while still giving you a sense of Superman and Clark Kent as individuals, or the latter as a tamped down powerless version of the former. This is a super being who could could have been evil and would have easily ruled the world had he been evil. But he was raised to be good in honour of his deeply implanted memories of his lost home planet Krypton, his uh, posthumous nurturing by his birth mother and father, whose lessons he ingested in the form of recordings en route to Earth, and, and the Kents who gave Superman Clark models of ground level decency to emulate. Once Superman leaves the nest, he continues to choose to be good, honouring both sets of parents. Forge, you are here for a reason, followed by his sad, disappointed, oh no, as he feels his pulse is one of the greatest and least appreciated line readings of that decade, absolutely. The essence of a man packed into just two words, along with crushing disappointment at the realisation that he won't see anything more. This Superman is a man on a mission to be America's fantasy vision of itself, or perhaps more accurately, the incarnation of its best self, or the idea which strives towards, uh, but rarely achieves. I used to think of Reeves' Superman as a man with no emotional interior, but watching it again recently, I was embarrassed to realise how wrong I was. Quite the contrary, Reeves' Superman's performance is filled with hints that this is a man who knows himself well, such as the way he smiles with amusement and admiration as he looks and listens to Lois on her terrace, and the moment at the end of that extraordinary sequence, can you read my mind, when he flies off into the night, and the camera slowly moves, a moves screen left to catch Clark knocking on Lois' door, embarrassed about having to ask if she forgot about the date she agreed to have with him that night. Superman doesn't love Lois because he wants to save her. He loves Lois because she doesn't expect anyone to save her. And because she tries to be as good as her job as Superman is at his. 
Her love for him is evolved, lust plus admiration. His love for her comes out of respect. Reeves Superman exerts great discipline to continue to be a person who inspires and bases his attitude towards others on how hard they are trying to treat everyone else, especially strangers, as if their lives matter. He has, he has might, what we might call a Jesus gaze. He forgives them for they know not what they do. He's as nice and kind as a superpowered person can be. Chris Evans, Captain America, Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther and Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman are the only modern day superheroes who get close to the Reeve vibe. I'll comment on this in a minute. They give performances as people who are serene and confident in their goodness. They seem to know that if you can play that kind of energy without winking at the audience to signal that you're actually square, it'll be as arresting as any villain's scenery chewing. I must say, I'm not sure about Chadwick Bosman. I do think Bosman's performance is brilliant as Black Panther. I will say that. But I think he's definitely right, the author of this piece, um, in, in terms of Gal Gadot, but especially Chris Evans. What Chris Evans did, does with his performance as um, a Captain America, right, Steve Rogers, is very similar to what Christopher Reeve did. And I think that was purposely done. I think Kevin Feige wanted to emulate Christopher Reeve. In fact, the whole MCU is a love letter, really, to what Donna did with Superman. Watch how Reeve as Superman looks at everyone, really looks at them, really sees them. He seems to feel varying degrees of sadness when he realises that not that they're not yet there yet and probably never will be but you never get the sense that he's measuring himself against them, finding them lacking and evaluating, evaluating his own self-image over their existence. He knows this isn't a contest. There are no winners or losers. Superman only scorns those who aren't good because they aren't interested in being good. He hates them not for bad deeds, they do, but their comfort in doing them. This is why he neutralises Otis with a look. He knows a guy like this doesn't deserve worse. So, sorry. And it's why he reacts to Luther unveiling his plan with horror and revolution. So primal that he loses his composure, calling out to Eve about the millions of innocent people who will die if Luther de detonates a stolen nuclear missile. In, in the San Andreas fault line, Reeves' choices here are the most daring of any actor in the film because the rawness of the character's emotions and his expressions of them punctures the airy light tone that Donna has established elsewhere so decisively that he that if might never have recovered from the follow up sequence. Superman saved by Eve keeps his word to her by stopping the missile aimed at Hackensack, her mother's hometown, but arrives in California as the bomb goes off, setting in motion a series of catastrophes that only Superman can avert, save one, the death. Of Lois Lane. I want to go back to a quote in Superman the movie. He says, uh, I remember this bit very vividly when he says millions of innocent people will die. The way Reeves does it, you look into that man's eyes and you believe this man cares. And this is who Superman is. And this is why millions of people around the world love him. And this is why Reeves is so amazing. And why Christopher Reeves' ghost of Superman haunts every actor who's ever going to play him. It's not that Brandon Ralph or Henry Cavill or Tom Welling aren't good enough and their performances aren't good. But you're basically up against the God. That's what it is. The entire performance is a setup for a series of punchlines that could be summed up as, yes, he really is that good. It's not a bit. And once the punchline lands, the recipient... The recipient becomes a true believer, sees Superman as a representing the best part of themselves and cheers for him as he does good deeds because his existence is aspirational. That I think is what spurs Superman's shriek of rage right before he turns back to save Lois. He turns back time to save Lois. His disappointment at himself at not being super enough and the pain of reliving the death of his father about whom he said at graveside, all those powers and I couldn't even save him. I can't have a conversation with anyone who thinks Superman turning back time is too much or unrealistic. 
Not only is this a story about a bulletproof extraterrestrial immigrant who can fly, the act itself is a swooningly grand romantic gesture, like something out of a fable. He's Orpheus descending into the underworld to find Eurydice and bring her back to the world of the living. But he heads in the other direction, out into space. Yeah, let me explain to you about that scene when he turns back time and he screams. It's one of the most powerful scenes you'll ever see, especially in a superhero scene. He screams and he flies out, right? She's dead and he thinks there's nothing he can do about it. And then he's hearing what he says at his father's graveside. Then Jor-El is saying, saying, you are forbidden to interfere in human history. He's hearing all these voices. At that moment, Superman isn't doing jor bidding or Jonathan's bidding. He isn't listening to them anymore. It's very similar to what Clark does on Smallville. He follows his own path and he says, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to save her life. She shouldn't be dead. This is not her time. But let's go back to the moment before Superman finally fails, because it's integral to the goodness of Superman and Superman after Luther fits him with kryptonite necklace and leaves him to drown in a pool. Eve saves him. Eve's reaction shots establish that she's initially impressed by Superman's handsome face and chiseled physique, as a committed gold digger would do. Then she immediately figures out that, yes, in fact, Superman really is that good. It's not a bit. He means it. And this leads Eve to measure Lex against Superman and realise that, one, she's gotten into a relationship that's entirely superficial, based around money and clothes and jewellery and material goods and proximity to power. And that too, she did that because she doesn't respect herself properly, probably because she's been with a lot of guys like Lex, though probably without the money and free a guy like Superman will never be within Eve's grasp because she's not trying hard enough to be the kind of person Superman would respect. So emotional. The moment in the swimming pool is about a character bettering herself after seeing Superman up close. It's a moment of transformation. She kisses him against his will when he's still powerless because she thinks she'll never have another chance with him or with somebody even remotely like him. She does not, for the most part, respect herself, which makes that moment where she dives into the water and saves Superman, Superman's life so powerful. We're seeing Super Eve, a woman re releasing her suppressed potential for goodness. And this is what Superman means to all of us. He makes us become better. I can't remember the amount of times I've done something and feel bad and think Superman would never do this. Clark would never do this. This is how inspirational and aspirational Superman is. Ray's performance is so strong. In fact, it validates the boldest storytelling gamble in the, in the movie. We don't see Superman in costume at all during the first part of the film save for a glimpse of the character flying away from the newly created Fortress of Solitude. And we don't get to the first night of Metropolis heroism until 65 minutes into a two and a half hour running time. It's the same tactic used in Godzilla movies, horror films and suspense pictures, but applied to a saviour instead of a threat. A film that takes its sweet time unveiling something like King Kong, Godzilla, the exomph, the shark in Jaws, the mothership in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, or the title creature of the thing, is betting that if they deliver something that's worth the builder, the audience will be overwhelmed. And we was. Viewers in 1978 were overwhelmed, and not just because a live action movie had finally convinced them that a man could fly. They were overwhelmed because Reeve acted the role with so much sincerity that it knocked down their cynical defence, which is a different sort of super, superheroic feat. The film's sense of humour has some, some this would never fly today, Clunk, clunkers like the black dude with um, fly threads, complimenting suits, bad outfit, and Eve letting Lex pimp her out as bait during the missile theft, and the special effects have dated as special effects always do. I don't agree with that. Um, you may say, oh, yeah, obviously they're not CG, but for physical effects, they're absolutely fantastic. You tell me with a straight face when Superman flies after the missile, right? And he's using all his force and all his will to catch it, if that's dated, because I think that's still amazing. Not only is that a great physical feat for uh, Richard Donner, but the real special effect of Superman 
is Christopher Reeve because he used to be a glider pilot and he knew how to do the body language. He knew how to move his body. He was a big part of the reason that film actually worked and the effects still look amazing. But the greatest special effect of all, Reeve's performance, will never date because it comes from a series of brilliant choices by a self-assured young actor, thoughtful guidance from script writers and a director who were all on the same page about the most important thing, whatever other difference they might have had during filming. I'll say that again. Important thing, whatever other differences they might have had during filming. The movie feels like a case of an entire production rising to the level of its lead actor, who happens to be playing the biggest square in the galaxy, a guy who would rather be decent than cool. This could not have been easy to pull off in the 1970s, time when anti-heroes, cruelty and cynicism were in the vogue, and public exhausted by nearly two decades of domestic unrest, foreign war and official corruption had started to think happy endings were superficial and or fantasy about what life could be, but isn't. Reeves Superman saved Superman. His performance is the reason it still flies. Wow. Author of this was Matt Zoller Zeitz. And wow, what, an, a, what a piece that was. Fuck, I'm not going to swear. Brilliant. Br absolutely fantastic. And I think he really does sum up this character played by Christopher Reeve. This was the first real Superman film ever made. There was others. There was the new, there was the Adventures of Superman with George Reeves, which was amazing. But this was a proper, big budgeted movie. And it's lasted the test of time. I know there's arguments about uh, Henry Cavill versus Christopher Reeve or Man of Steel versus Superman the movie and things like that. I love both films, by the way. But this film is the reason that Superman still goes on. This film is the reason that I will always love Superman and hold him so high as an inspiration. It was such an amazing film. It was really the first film that had such an impression of me. Imagine people in the 70s and 80s watching a film like this. And isn't it interesting when Matt talks about, you know, the 70s and how, how depressing they were. We are in the same era now. We're in a depressing time where happy endings seem impossible. And we've all become very cynical. The world needs Superman again to inspire it. And I hope we get more Henry Cavill as Superman. I hope we get whatever J.J. Abrams is planning. And it's also inspirational. Superman is the most important character and superhero we have. And the point being with what Matt says in this article is, the whole point is, he is, he's kind instead of cool. I know a lot of people don't understand that, but it's kindness. Kindness isn't very cool, is it? When we hear people saying, be kind, we kind of laugh at them, don't we? But this guy is kind and he does look at people like they're his equal and he's not above them, even though he's from Krypton and he's a god. He wants to make things better for us. And that, my friends, is the greatest God of all. Comment down below, like, share and subscribe and I'll be back tomorrow with the DCEU Daily. See you again soon.